As part of a year reporting on climate change, I've joined the Swedish ship Odin in Punta Arenas, Chile. It's early December 2006. The Odin is one of the world's most powerful non-nuclear icebreakers. She's on the last leg of a cruise from Sweden to America's McMurdo Station, the largest research base in Antarctica. The purpose of the six-month, 24,000-mile journey is to perform a job barely a few miles long. The southern continent at McMurdo is fringed with a 15-mile-wide strip of solid ice up to several yards thick. This barrier, called fast ice, because it clings fast to the coast, denies McMurdo access to ships. Our mission down here is to um, break up the channel into McMurdo and uh, also to escort the ships uh, into McMurdo. So, so that's what we are going to do and hopefully we will manage it, but <laughs> we will see. McMurdo has a summer population of about 1,000 scientists, technicians and helpers. Almost everything they use for food, lodging and work, from toilet paper to tuna, arrives in two annual shipments. We have two ships that come in. One is a dry cargo vessel and one is a fuel tanker. Fuel is used as to produce electricity and heat and uh, without it uh, we can't continue to operate. Uh, we have an opportunity once a year for these vessel deliveries, bring in uh, about 9 million gallons of petroleum products and about 12 million pounds of supplies for the station. Our cruise from Chile takes us through the Drake Passage, famous for rough seas and high winds, though we're let off easy. We travel down the coast of the Antarctic Peninsula and circle west around the frozen continent's perimeter. Several scientific studies are taking place on the Odin. One involves making measurements of sea ice for comparison with satellite measurements. It's called ground truthing. Instruments in space can cover more territory and make more frequent observations than people on ships ever can. But for them to be useful, scientists have to calibrate the space-based instruments with measurements on the ground. Another study is a wildlife census. The, the study is pretty simple in one sense, that we're just we're allowed to be on the ship during this transit to collect some information on seabirds, penguins, marine mammals in an area that doesn't often get visited. We don't have any control over the, the route that we're taking, but it is an opportunity to see what's out here, or what's not out here. I mean, both of those are very important. In a round-the-clock survey, the four-member wildlife team cites most of Antarctica's flying birds, including albatrosses, shearwaters, petrels, skuas, and fulmars. Later, when Odin travels through sea ice, they encounter most of the continent's marine mammals, and of course penguins. The research on this cruise could, among other things, help scientists understand if global warming is having an impact on this part of Antarctica. Though sea ice near the Antarctic Peninsula is known to have declined dramatically, scientists know less about some of the areas along the Odin's route. Sea ice plays a critical role in the breeding and feeding of many of the species we'll encounter. Despite stunning sunsets and exotic seabirds, the trip becomes monotonous by the eighth day. We've sailed through 2,500 miles of open water, almost the width of the U.S., at the leisurely pace of a bike ride. Then icebergs appear. These giant blocks come from the massive ice shelves that protrude into the sea off Antarctica's humongous glaciers. Such bergs can be hundreds of feet thick and tens of miles across. Our route steers clear of any that big. Even so, we sail by some probably much bigger than the iceberg that sank the Titanic. Chief Officer Matthias Peterson assures me we're perfectly safe. The hull is made of two-inch thick, extra-dense steel. I find Peterson on the bridge, seven stories above waterline. Between those three icebergs. Do you see the, the ice here? You're able to run straight into it, and you, the vessel is supposed to be able to, to take that uh, hit. The, the, the hull will no problems uh, deal with that. Now we enter a dense band of sea ice that will take us several days to cross. 
Unlike icebergs, which are pieces of the Antarctic ice sheet, sea ice is frozen seawater. Depending on whether it formed recently or has survived many seasons, sea ice is anywhere from inches to yards thick. At first, we see only scattered chunks. Penetrating deeper, we encounter patches stretching beyond sight. Today, right now, we're just surrounded by really, really large um, crust of frozen... Here's a seal here. The wildlife team snaps shots of crab-eater seals, partly to document gashes in their hides, evidence of close encounters with their predator, this, uh, the leopard seal. This one seal, we can confirm what it is. I had imagined sea ice as a smooth, glittering plain, but it's not like that. It's actually formed from chunks, or flows, of every size and shape. Wind and currents constantly reorganize the pieces. Ridges rise up where they clash. Sinuous waterways, or leads, appear where they break apart. There are more icebergs here as well. Some, flat-topped with sharp edges, are like pieces broken from mammoth crackers. These sheared off the continent recently. Other ones have been drifting for years, eroded and fractured. Some have fanciful spires and turrets, like the sagging ruins of a long-lost city. That was a ridge over there, so we just went into it, and then we wait to see where it's going to crack, and you saw we were maneuvering the vessel into the crack. Matthias Peterson maneuvers the 13,000-ton Odin with the finger-operated joystick. I expected to hear a satisfying crack as Odin sliced six-foot-thick flows in two. But that sound is drowned out by the rumble of the engine, the whistling of the wind, and the roar of the waves. What I do hear is the scraping of the ice against the hull. But that sounds like a clothes dryer full of sneakers. Peterson follows open water leads whenever possible. But sometimes there are no leads or they go the wrong way. He says crossing flows retards but rarely halts the ship. Sometimes it's some very hard to get through and you have to go forward and you have to go back and you have to ram and you ram your way. Peterson's attention shifts constantly from a bank of controls to several glowing radar screens to a pair of binoculars. That one that we see over there. So he says navigating this terrain requires skill, experience, and patience. Sometimes you have, you're supposed to avoid the ridgy areas and go to the, to the smooth and uh, even, just like this flow you see here, that one is very nice, that we will smash in, in no time. But sometimes it can be the opposite around. You should not go into that, you should go into the ridgy areas instead. And that you have to, you cannot see that really. You have to, to feel on the ice, you have to get into it and predict how it's going to be. Finally, in late December, two weeks after leaving port, Odin has almost traversed the broad sea ice band and is nearing a new expanse of open water. Female and a pup. Soon we'll arrive at our destination the thick sheet of fast ice that bars McMurdo's access to the sea. I think that's the first pair like that I've seen together. It's Christmas Eve day. I depart Odin from McMurdo by helicopter. It must be. The kids are together with the parents. Exactly. Leaving the ship just as her real work begins. They're being unhappy about their Christmas presents, like all children everywhere. 